بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Brothers and sisters, welcome to our final lecture of the Companions of the Quran, Dawrah 2011, uh, and the closing of our uh, of our gathering, inshallah ta'ala. We are very pleased to have with us, as we had in the beginning, uh, Sheikh Asim al-Hakim, um, who will deliver a lecture on the rope of Allah. Uh, and uh, inshallah, without further ado, we would like to present the Sheikh. Jazakum Allah khair. <coughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته There are two ayahs in سورة آل عمران and these two ayahs are indeed one of the greatest ayahs of the Qur'an because it incorporates a lot of messages and lessons that as Muslims we must learn and abide by. This ayah is ayah number 102 and 103 from Surah Al-Imran. Allah Azza wa Jal says, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared and die not except in a state of Islam and hold fast all of you together to the rope of Allah and be not divided among yourselves and remember Allah's favor on you for you were enemies one to another but he joined your hearts together so that by his grace you became brethren and you were on the brink of a pit of fire and he saved you from it. Thus Allah makes his ayah clear to you or ayat clear to you that you may be guided. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, says that whenever you hear Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, give it your attention because if it, it is something that is good for you, Allah is directing you to, or something that is bad for you, Allah is warning you not to do. And this ayah is clear. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. So fear Allah as he is supposed to, or as he should be feared. And how is Allah should be feared? How should we fear Allah Azza wa Jal? Ibn Mas'ud says, may Allah be pleased with him. He should be feared to the extent that he should be obeyed and not disobeyed. He should be remembered and not ever forgotten. And he should be thanked and not ever reject or neglect thanking him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what Ibn Mas'ud says, may Allah be pleased with him. However, this ayah, when it first was revealed, it caused a lot of trouble to the companions. Because when Allah says, fear Allah as he should be feared, this is something that no one can do. How can we fear Allah as he should be feared? So the companions started praying night prayer until their feet were swollen. They started fasting days without end. They started giving uh, a charity. They started doing good things, but yet they could not fulfill the criteria, which is to fear Allah as he should be feared. And that is what made some scholars say that this ayah was abrogated by the other ayah in Surah At-Taghabun, where Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ Mastata'tum fear Allah to the best of your ability. So now when you look at this ayah, you understand it in context, in the sense that fear Allah as He should be feared to the best of your ability. And this means that on the day of judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal would hold you accountable to your ability, not to something else. There isn't a benchmark that you will be measured against 
or next to. There is your ability and no one knows your ability except Allah Azza wa Jal. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us that to worship Him as He should be feared or fear Him as He should be feared and die not except in the state of Islam. And this is an instruction. However, can anyone say that I can fulfill this? It is not within my reach. It is not in accordance to my choice that I'll die in a state of Islam. Only Allah Azza wa Jal knows how my life will conclude. And that is why in the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, this is the third quote we quote on Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. You all know Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. And we spoke about him uh, in the first lecture. And that he is one of the four that the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to learn the Qur'an from. One of the learned companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud told us in the hadith, in a number of hadiths also, that the Prophet ﷺ told us that a man may do deeds of the people of Jannah to what appears to the people for 60 years. And then at the very end, Allah Azza wa Jal wills it and he does something from the acts of the people of hell and he dies on that and he enters hell. 60 years he's been worshipping Allah, he's been fasting, he's been doing good things. But the conclusion is what counts. And this is why the Prophet says, verily that deeds are by, usually when I say this people say intention. And this is correct, this is hadith. Uh, one of the authentic, most authentic hadiths. But there is another hadith which is what is relevant to our topic. Deeds are by their conclusion. So you may do a lot of good things, but at the end, you conclude that with something bad and it nullifies all of your good deeds. And the opposite is also correct. You may have someone who was so notorious, sinful, far away from Islam, and all of a sudden, SubhanAllah, Allah guides his heart, and five, ten minutes, he dies afterwards. He goes to, to Jannah, and that is why the man who killed a hundred soul went to a scholar and said, I've killed a hundred person. So is there any means, is there any way for me to repent? Said, yes. But the village you're living in is a bad village. The company you're with are bad. You have to choose a better company. Therefore, leave the village you're in, go to XYZ village, because the people there worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Stay with them and inshallah you'll be on the right track. In the middle of the way, it was his time. So, he died. The angels of hell came to claim him. The angels of mercy came to claim him. And they disputed. Imagine angels dispute about uh, over one person. And Allah Azza wa sent an angel to solve this dispute. And he sent him in the uh, 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 form of a man, as in the hadith. And the angels of hell said, the man did not do a single good thing in his life. And he killed a hundred people. So we have to take him and the angels of mercy said yeah, the man is going to that village in repentance and his heart is filled with remorse so this erases everything else so when they disputed the angel who was said sent to to solve the problem said measure between the two cities and to either one he's closer he he can be claimed by the angels. So they measured it and they found him that he was closer to the righteous village more than the sinful village. In another hadith, authentic hadith, Allah Azza wa Jal told the righteous village to come closer and told the sinful village to be further from the man. So it is Allah Azza wa Jal who made this happen. So it is essential for us to Try and die as Muslims, though this is not in our hands. So what can we do about this? 
we have to live as Muslims. We have to practice as Muslims. We have to try our level best to be on the straight path. Do your best, and this is all what Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to do. Because you can't do more than your best. And if you are sincere, if you do your best and try to practice, to implement, to abide by the Quran and the Sunnah, in this case, inshallah, with the will of Allah, with the mercy and grace of Allah, you will die as a Muslim. So Allah Azza wa is telling us to die and to be steadfast on Islam until we die as Muslims. And unfortunately, to remain steadfast on Islam is very difficult. It's not an easy thing. And that is why the Prophet wasallam, in the hadith of Ummu Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, he used to so often say, Oh Allah, who turns hearts, make my heart steadfast on Islam. This is the majority of his dua. The hadith says the, the most dua that the Prophet used to always repeat والسلام, is not, Oh Allah, grant me money. Oh Allah, pay my debts. Oh Allah, do this or do that. It was, Oh Allah, who turns heart, make my heart steadfast on Islam. And I bet you, and betting is haram, but this is a figure of speech. Huh? I bet you, if we make a survey among all of us, who is afraid that his heart would be turned away from Islam, none of us would say I. We're so confident, we take this for granted, that we are in, we are in, in paradise, inshallah. We eventually, after death, we're going to paradise, but I'm not sure, is it the white uh, 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 castle? Or the, uh, uh, the black one. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant. I didn't make up my mind. And this is awkward. This is not the fear that we should have in our hearts. We should be afraid. Abdullah ibn al-Mughaffal, may Allah be pleased with him. He heard one of his sons. And he's a companion. He heard his son saying, Oh Allah, I ask you, the white house, the white palace, to the right of the people entering paradise so as if he, he had googled it and he knew that the first when you enter paradise there's a white palace so he's asking this from allah Azza wa Jal. what did uh, his, his father abdullah said abdullah mughaffal may allah be pleased with him he said my son don't do that ask allah for jannah and seek refuge from hell because the, I heard the Prophet say there will be from my ummah people exaggerating they go beyond the borders in dua so this is part of the dua that you exaggerate and you go out of your way you should not ask such things so the prophet used to always supplicate in this hadith or this dua ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik so when he was asked he said yes the hearts are between two fingers of Allah's fingers. Two fingers of Allah's fingers. And he flips them as he wishes. So without Allah Azza wa Jal giving you the power to remain steadfast on Islam, Wallahi Akhi, it is as easy as this. I've seen, and you've seen as well, so many righteous people who went back on their heels and they're not practicing anymore. And some of them became, not only not practicing, they became deviant. They became enemies of Islam. So many people who used to pray with us in the masjid turned to be, after a while, hypocrites. Attacking Islam. And doing whatever they can to undermine the efforts of the spread of Islam. Some da'is who were used to be, mashallah, now look at them. Where are they? What happened to them? Why is this? Because Allah Azza wa Jal did not want them to remain steadfast on Islam. Or at least on the right track. And that is why they flipped. So, it is essential that we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to hold our hearts steadfast to Islam. And at the same time to try our best to practice. Because Allah Azza wa Jal warned us. And this is a threat and a warning. Allah says that we flip 
and turn their hearts and sights as they did not embrace it or accept it in the first time. وَنُقَلِّبُ أَيْدَتَهُمْ وَأَبْصَارَهُمْ كَمَا لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهِ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً so this is a threat from Allah when truth comes to you and you do not embrace it and you do not accept it and you do not apply it in your life, then Allah will seal your heart. And that is why so many times people come to us and tell us, Akhi, this is from the Quran, this is from the Sunnah, and we are unable to accept that or do it. Why? Not because of our intellect or actually of our stupidity, but because our hearts are, were sealed due to the fact that we've rejected this in the very beginning. The second ayah, of course, the first ayah has a lot of more lessons to it, but the time does not permit us to, to go on. The second ayah, which is related to the topic, and that is Allah Azza wa Jal says, and abide by the rope of Allah, all of you together. Hold fast, all of you together, to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal. And what is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is an authentic hadith that the Qur'an is the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal that extends to the heavens. This is a hadith, authentic hadith. And there are other interpretations such as the rope of Allah is Islam. So abide by the rope of Allah, hold fast to the rope of Allah, that is Islam. And also there are other interpretations saying that it is the jama'ah, the jama'ah of the Muslims and all of these interpretations go into the same meaning. You cannot survive without abiding by Islam. And if you watch what or, or you contemplate about what Allah Azza wa Jal warned us from, He told us to abide or to hold fast to the rope of Allah and not to divide. And what is the division? that Allah tells us not to do. Is it the difference of opinion that we have between the different four schools of thought, between the Shafi'i, the Maliki, the Hanafi, the Hanbali? Definitely not. Because the companions themselves, may Allah be pleased with them, differed and they had their own opinions. So what is what Allah Azza wa is telling us not to do? It is the division that the Prophet ﷺ told us that will exist in his followers at the end of time, where he said that my ummah will, divide, will, be, will be divided into 73 sects. This is a prophecy, and this has been fulfilled. <coughs> 73 sects, all of them are in, in hell, except one. Who is this one? the one that follows the Prophet ﷺ and the footsteps of his companions. So everyone else is in hell. Division that Allah tells us not to have does not happen except by shaitan. Who is the one who drives you to be divided, is to separate from one another? It is shaitan. This is his handiwork. This is his craft. And he is experienced, isn't he? He is very experienced. If someone asks me to submit my CV, my CV would probably be a couple of pages, three pages at most, with all the experience in the courses and, and, and the positions I assumed in my life. Shaitan's CV, on the other hand, is so long and it's so rich. This guy did everything you can think of. From Adam's time till today, he is responsible for divorces, for killings, for looting, for sinning, for not praying, for acts of apostasy, for worshipping idols. This is his job and he knows what he's doing. He's very good in it. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ told us that shaitan has despaired, has given up hope that the worshippers in the Arabian Peninsula would worship him. The people who pray, no way, he, he gave up hope. But the only thing he did not give up hope is that he would cause enmity and division among them. 
And this is what he is doing, and this is what the Prophet is telling us, Alaihissalam, to be careful not to fall in his traps. Who is the one who made the son of Adam kill his brother? Shaitan. Who is the one who made the brothers of Yusuf, peace be upon him, throw him in the well and leaving him for dead? Shaitan. And you look at the history, and you'll always find him uh, there trying to separate the Muslims and divide them. And among the things that he does best is throwing enmity and hatred in the hearts of Muslims. And that is why Islam is based a lot, has based a lot of emphasis on not doing this. Yani, just brainstorming, if you wish. In a few minutes, if you just sit down and hold a pen and a paper and write down the things that Islam tells you not to do so that you would not make your brother angry with you or you would not throw hatred uh, uh, and cause hatred between you, you'll find that there are a lot of things. For example, the Prophet wasallam forbade that a Muslim proposes to a woman that his brother has proposed to. So if I know that my brother has proposed to a woman and they've accepted, he, he did not marry, he just proposed. And I know that if I go, they'll turn him down and take me instead. So I go and do that. This is, this is haram. Why? For the woman, I might be a better person, but because his heart will be broken and because I know that he has already done this, Allah Azza wa Jal forbids this and makes it a sin. If he bought something from a shop and I went in and I said, how much did you sell this for? He said, oh, it's already sold. How much did you sell it for? He says, 10. I said, I'll give you 11. I'll raise the price so that I can buy it off him and he would make that transaction void. Allah Azza wa Jal made this kind of transaction forbidden as well. As well. In Islam, it is forbidden to brag about your lineage or your tribe or your country. And the Prophet made that one of the major sins in Islam. Imagine that. I come from this country. I come from that tribe. This is haram. This is one of the major sins in Islam. Likewise, if you brag and, and you're proud of your madhab, I come from this madhab or this school of thought. I'm better than you. I'm more knowledgeable than you. Again, this is haram. Labeling people and being proud of your label is haram. The best of labels is the label of al-Ansar and al-Muhajirin. They're the best of people. Yet when the Prophet ﷺ heard them call each other because of a feud that took place between two of the youngsters, one from al-Ansar and one from Muhajirin, and each one called his tribe, Ya Ansar, Ya Muhajiri. And they came to fight the Prophet Sallallahu who is proclaiming the proclamation of the Jahiliyyah. Who is calling the name of Jahiliyyah? He made that call, the pre-Islamic era call. Something from related to the idol worshippers. Though they are the Muhajirin and the Ansar. So you have to be careful when you use such names. The Prophet also forbade alayhi salatu wasalam an namima which is how do you translate that? Backbiting. No, backbiting is different. Namima is, is taking hmm? no, it's not slander. I'll, I'll explain it. It saves time. Namima is when I hear something from the brother about a brother and I take what I heard to the brother and say, he said so and so and so. So that yeah, and gossiping so with the intention of fueling a feud. Backbiting is when I talk with the brother about the third one who's not here and say, MashaAllah, the brother is so fat. And he's fat. Don't get me wrong. He is fat. But just because we said something that he does not approve of, though it's true, this is backbiting. If he's not fat and I say he's fat, this is not backbiting, this is buhtan. This is even a, 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 a lower uh, uh, form of sin and even uh, greater in burden at the side of Allah. So 
This kind of gossip is forbidden. Why? Because it is resulting in hatred between the Muslims. And we do this extremely well, especially the sisters, unfortunately. The, the boys have it. The, the gents definitely have it. But those who gossip a lot, did you hear what she said about you when you came to the wedding last night? Oh, the dress you, you wore that dress two years ago. Doesn't she have money to buy another dress? Ah, she said that. Uh, she, she didn't look up, uh, at this or that. And this, this, mashallah, good Samaritan goes and tells her, well, she said so and so and so about you. And khalas. And that is the act and the doing of shaitan. Because he does this best between the man and his wife until he separates. And likewise, among the humans, those who go to the wife and say, why, why do you tolerate your husband? He does this, he does that. You should demand for more pay, for a better house. You should ask for your rights. You should show him the red eye. And they continue to do what they're doing so that they would destroy marriages. The Prophet ﷺ forbade a najwa, the secret talk. Imagine if we're three in a car. Two of the brothers speak Urdu. I don't. And they're speaking together in Urdu. And I'm like a deaf duck. What's happening? This is haram. Why? Because I don't know what they're talking. They might be talking at me, uh, uh, about me. And Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran that this najwa, this secret talk is from shaitan. It is from shaitan so that he would throw a form of intimidation, depress, depresses people by doing this. So you are not allowed, if you're a group of people, to talk on your own with someone in isolation or in seclusion. You have to either take his permission, Akhi, we would like to talk in our uh, language, or we, talk, we have something to discuss, but we don't want you to, to listen to it. So it's okay. Usually the guy says, no, it's not good. <laughs> Definitely not. Do it some other time. So you are not allowed to do this. Also in Islam, Allah tells us that when you're sitting and someone comes, that you give him some space. Because if you don't give him some space, what would happen? Hey, these guys don't like me. So I would have something against you, hold something against you. Islam tells you to spread salam to whoever, to whoever you see among the Muslims. Why? Because this makes you closer. If I see you in Siberia or in uh, the North Pole, I know that you're a Muslim, I can tell. So the minute I see you, I'm, not, I, I'm gonna pretend I didn't see you. Yeah, there's no one except us and the penguins. <laughs> if I see you, Islam tells me that it is haram for me to give you my back. And this came in an authentic hadith. The Prophet says, لا تدابروا. Do not give each one your back. لا تناجشوا. Do not sell in najash. Najash is raising the price, though I don't want it. The people are bid bidding on this pen. The brother is bidding. He looks like, you know, he's, he's not very well versed in the markets. So I say, he says five, five pounds. No, seven pounds. And he thinks that, oh, if... He's betting for seven, then it means it, it, it deserves more. Ten pounds, so it's 15 pounds. And I raise the price, though it does not, yeah, it, 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 it's not worth even one pound. So that I can fool him. Uh, the Prophet called this form of transaction in Arabic, najash. And najash is forbidden. So all of this is forbidden so that the hearts would be clean, that we would be united. The Prophet even encouraged us, as some, whenever you see your brother, he said that smiling in the face of another is hasana, charity. Providing it's the same sex, huh? You don't go, you don't go to the opposite sex and give a big smile and say, I'm looking for charity. <laughs> no, you're looking for sin. No, you have, it has to be the same sex, otherwise you have a, a problem. So do what you can to help others, Muslims. And by doing this, you get closer, you get united. Now, to be united and not to divide cannot be except on the basis of the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the companions. May Allah be pleased with them. So 
We cannot unite because simply we're called Muslim, yet you go on the right and I go on the left. We have to be united on the Quran and the Sunnah. Otherwise, our unity has a lot of problems. And that is why the jama'ah is very important. The Prophet says, السلام, emphasizing the concept of unity and of congregation, even when it comes to fasting and breaking your fast, it depends on the, on the community. So the fasting is when you all fast, and breaking the fast is when you all break the fast. It's the majority of the Muslims and the unity. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Prophet said السلام, that the hand of Allah Azza wa Jal is with the jama'ah. And what is the jama'ah? Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, said, jama'ah is whatever coincides with the truth, even if you're alone. So it's not the, the number of people. It is the methodology. It is the way of thinking. It is the school that you're following. Imagine Ibrahim, peace be upon him, when he was revealed to, and he called his people to Islam. How many Muslims were there? How many Muslims were there at the time of Ibrahim? Not a single soul. Not a, no, he was Ummah, as Allah Azza wa described him in the Quran. He was Ummah. He was a nation. He was a man worthy of everything, mashallah. May Allah uh, uh, peace and blessing be upon him. However, if he followed the concept of the majority, he would not have accepted, he, he would not have done what he had done. Are you guys with me? So, hi. So he preached, he called people, he gave da'wah, though he was one. And this is the truth. <coughs> that if you are on the truth, if you are on the right track, if you're abiding by the Quran and Sunnah, even if the whole world, even if the whole world goes against you, you're still in good hands because you're following the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the companions of the Salaf. May Allah be pleased with them. And that is why we may differ, but our difference of opinion does not justify our fighting. Ibn Mas'ud, this is quote number five. May Allah be pleased with him. In Hajj, he performed Hajj with Uthman ibn Affan. And Uthman was the Amir, Amir al -Mumirin. He was the third caliph. And Uthman used to pray in Mina, Dhuhr and Asr and Isha, four. When we know that we, he should have prayed, two. And he kept on constantly opposing this and saying, no, the Prophet prayed it two, Abu Bakr prayed it two, Umar prayed it two, and Uthman had his own reasons. He had said, I married a wife in Mecca, so I think that I'm not entitled to shorten. And this was wrong. Yet, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, whenever the prayer was called for, he used to pray behind Uthman and he used to pray for because he was the Imam. So they told him, now you oppose him and you say that the Sunnah is two. Yet you're praying behind him for. Why is that? He said, Al Khilafu Shar. The division and being separated is evil. He has his own opinion. And I follow him because he's the Amir. I can't go against the Amir. But I have to say and I have to make it clear to the people that this is not accordance to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Therefore, we have to respect one another. Yunus al Sadafi, one of the companions or one of the rivals, if you wish, of Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i. May Allah have mercy on their souls. Muhammad Idris al-Shafi'i is the Imam al-Shafi'i, the well-known Imam. He said, Yunus, he said that I debated, I argued once over a topic with an Imam al-Shafi'i. And it was prolonged. It was taking so much of our time. And at the end, none of us was convinced with the other person's opinions. So we've split. The following day, now imagine you, you spend like two hours debating with the brother on a topic and he does not want to um, accept what you're saying. He's not willing to uh, um, believe or at least uh, be convinced. So after two or three hours, 
after debating, there is something in the heart. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's hard-headed. He's not willing to listen. The following day, Yunus says, Subhanallah, I've never seen anyone as wise as the Shafi. After debating him for so long, the following day he came and he took my hand. And he said, Yunus, isn't it possible that we differ over something? and yet still and remain to be brothers in Islam. See how wise he is. Nowadays, do we have this wisdom in us? No. I'm George W. Bush. If you're not with me, you're against me. This is what a lot of the Muslims are doing. They look at each other. Um, yeah, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why aren't you a carbon copy of me? Because everybody else is wrong. I'm the only one who's right. This is what people think, unfortunately. And this shows you how ignorant and little knowledge they have. Because people have been always differing in their opinions. And, and this goes without saying. You have the four schools of thought differing on almost everything. But this does not take them out of the fold of Islam. Because they are based on evidence and they gave everything they had trying to reach a conclusion that is in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah and they all said whenever my verdict or my opinion goes against the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, throw my opinion in the dustbin throw it at the wall neglect it don't even look at it and this is the proper way of doing it so we cannot <clears throat> hold tight Hold, uh, 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 to abide by the rope of Allah, except by the Quran, the Sunnah, and the understanding of the Salaf. Now, if you look around, you will find the enemies of Islam wishing us well. Is that true? Are they wishing us well? No, no, no. Yeah, right. We wish. Everybody saying yes. Are they? I'm the, I'm the wrong place then. The enemies of Islam are not wishing us well. They're plotting. They're doing what they can to get us out of Islam. Not necessarily to their religion, because this is an honor that we are not worthy of. They don't want us to embrace their religion. They just want us to leave our religion. The hypocrites are there. And they're doing what they are doing by the best of means. And that is divide and rule, or divide and conquer. So they want to divide us. If we would like to prevail if we want to be successful. There is no other way except by abiding by the Quran and Sunnah and sticking to or, or, or holding fast to the rope of Allah Azza wa which is the Quran. Now, does this mean that we can have no boundaries when it comes to Islam? We can work with any Muslim group or any Muslim ethnicity or sect or whatever no you have to look into that group if that group is doing something that is considered to be a uh, part of the things that nullifies islam you cannot abide, you cannot work with them i cannot work with someone who curses the sahaba this is yeah, you, there's no compromise someone that curses the sahaba or talks about Aisha, may Allah be with her, or Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and nullifies their Islam and say they all committed an act of apostasy. I cannot work with him. Someone who says that, yes, I'm Muslim, the Quran is fine, but there is a prophet after Muhammad, you guys didn't know of, and the prophet did not know of. So we're Muslims. He's not Muslim. This is an act of apostasy, an act of shirk. I cannot work with someone who says that, Akhi, we're Muslims, we only abide by the Quran. The Sunnah, we do not accept it. Because it might have been altered and changed. It might have been uh, 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 written by uh, this or that. Again, this is an act of apostasy. Those who do not believe in the Sunnah are not Muslims. Because otherwise Allah Azza wa would not have sent to us his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So we have to look into what these sects believe. If they commit an act that nullifies their Islam, there is no communication between us. We can't. 
we can eat what a Jew or a, or a Christian slaughters. Is that true? But we cannot eat what these people slaughter because they're not Jew or Muslim or Christian. This is the only slaughtering we can eat if performed by a Muslim, Jew or Christian. And therefore, one would have to look into what the people believe. If they differ with us in minor things, but the aqidah is okay, the methodology is okay, our point of reference is Quran and Sunnah, then we don't have a problem. Even if they differ with us in particular things, but they, it doesn't nullify their Islam, and the point of reference is always the Quran and Sunnah, we're in safe hands. But when they commit acts that nullify Islam, or they don't refer to a Quran or Sunnah, or they belittle the Sunnah, as I've seen some of those da'is, so-called da'is, and when you tell them that the Prophet said, I say, hey, come on, this is nothing. And they neglect it. And they said, yes, yaqi, the Prophet said so-and-so, but Abu Hanifa said, uh, Ahmad bin Hanbal said, Shafi'i said, Malik said, they oppose and reject and refute the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with the people's talk. Normal people, even Imams. Wallah, it's not acceptable. Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him, and I have mercy in his soul, said a beautiful statement. He said, if we receive something in the Quran, we embrace it immediately. And if we receive a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, it is on our head. We have no second thoughts. If, but, and if we re re receive something from the companions, now the companions differed with each other. He says we do not go out of the loop of the companions, meaning that we have to take a verdict from one of the companions, but not a verdict outside of the companions' uh, opinions, because their opinion, one of it is, is definitely true. He says, but if we receive something from other than the companions, then they are men and we are men. There's no difference between us and them. They don't have any uh, uh, form of uh, uh, priority. It is only for the Quran, the Sunnah, and the companions of the Prophet wasallam. And I believe that, yani, inshallah, this should suffice. Though the ayahs, as I've stated, requires a lot and a lot of lessons to be learned. And if you go to the books of Tafsir, you will find, inshallah, more elaboration on that. I pray to Allah that he makes me and you among those who abide by the rope of Allah and that he concludes our lives on forms of worship and on shahadat la ilaha illallah so that he is pleased with us. Wallahu a'lamu nisbatul ilmi ilayhi aslamu sallallahu sallam wa barakal abdi wa rasulina bin Muhammad.